So it was a little over 100 years ago, scientists figured out that they could grow big plants with only three elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But it takes 30 elements to make healthy plants, animals, and humans. You don't have to be great in math to know that if you pull 30 out for every three you put back in, eventually you're going to have a problem. And even CIA.gov published this a few decades ago, global mineral depletion is creating a global health problem. So that's the start. If you don't have it, you can't give it. The soil can't give it to the plants. Then the plants can't give it to the animals. The plants and animals can't give it to the humans. Uh, and there's the global nutrition report that says for decades now, malnutrition is the number one cause of death on the planet. Many decades ago, people were starving to death from lack of food being available, but now there's just nothing in the food. Empty calories. Welcome to the Excellence Project. My name is Eric Worre, and today we have my friend, Dr. Bob Rakowski, and he is a combination of wellness expert and part-time network marketing professional. It's a unique combination. I think you're gonna get a lot of value. We talk a lot about health hacks, a lot about what needs to happen in order for us to have a health span and not just lifespan. And then we talk about how a healthcare professional created a second business to support his health objectives with his patients using network marketing. I think you're going to enjoy it. With no further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Dr. Bob Rukowski. Dr. Bob Rukowski, how are you doing? Eric, I'm epic. Honored to be your guest, my friend. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. What kind of a doctor are you? Well, uh, you know, by degree, I'm a chiropractor, but I've got postgraduate certifications in nutrition, acupuncture, and kinesiology. So I'd like to say I'm, I'm holistic to the nth degree, really looking into functional medicine. Functional medicine. So what do you mean by functional medicine? I'm going to define it as Dr. David Perlmutter does. By the way, he's board certified neurologist, board certified in nutrition, best-selling New York Times author. He says functional medicine is the opposite of dysfunctional medicine. And he calls dysfunctional medicine anything that does not actually look at cause and effect, just tries to put a Band-Aid or a cover-up on a symptom hmm. rather than figuring out how the person got themselves in trouble in the first place. So, I, I mean, Gary Brecka has been here. He's a friend. Uh, talk about this human biology stuff. He's not, yeah. a, he's not an MD either, uh, but human biologist studies all this stuff, photographic memory, all these different things. Um, kind of biohacking, biostacking, uh, non traditional prescription heavy big pharma going opposite of all that stuff. Is that, is that similar in the vein? Very, very similar. I, I love Gary Brecca. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he's a great voice. Grant Cardone was smart as could be to partner with him. Mm -hmm. He's going to make the world better in so many ways. And thank you for sharing them with the world. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. The, the, the um, you know, my friends, you get to a certain age, you want to make sure you're going to live longer. You don't want to be successful, have a bunch of money, and then not be able to enjoy it. It, it, it doesn't even make any sense, right. right? So having this idea of longevity and health span instead of just lifespan, like how long can you live well versus living longer and you know drinking out of a tube or something uh, at some point is what everybody seems to be interested in. And everybody's kind of playing in this game of longevity. And it seems like everybody's doing cold plunges and red light therapy and oxygen therapy and infrared saunas and hyperbaric chambers and the works, you know, hydrogen water. I mean, everything top to bottom. Are you seeing the same thing as far as oh, pe course. people being like into it? Yeah. And, you know, when you start looking at longevity, it's not a new topic. You know, we, we've always wanted to look better, feel better, live longer. And now the science is clearly showing the direction we're heading as, an, as a nation. I think that's what's really got it. We, we become so sick, so drug dependent, so disconnected from what it really is that keeps us healthy. Hmm. Uh, and if we can get back to nature to a very high degree, I'm a fan of science where science leads us in the right direction. But science makes a lot of money, too, and that can sway some opinions, maybe in directions that aren't in the best interest of society. Yeah, so the this idea of finding the balance, instead of prescribing something for a symptom, trying to find the cause, and 
I mean, is is the answer really grounding, whole foods, vitamin D, first light, um, kind of clean eating? Sure. All all of that stuff, getting good sleep, is is that? How far can we get with that stuff versus having to deal with systemic stuff? Oh my gosh, I think a long way. You know, for decades now, I was on the functional medicine circuit, you know, taught on six different continents, over 10,000 hours of seminars, and I call them the magnificent seven. You've got to eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, talk right every single day. And by the way, there's another seven where mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, social, financial, impactful beings. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. You have to do that again. All right. Which what, one? Are, what are the, the first seven? All right, go, eat, go slow and, right. and, and, and give me like 15 seconds on each of the seven. Sure. All right. Eat right. If God made it, it's okay. If man made it, stay away. Drink right. We're mostly water. The earth is mostly water. The body's mostly water. Clean water. But how about turbocharged water, right? And you, you, whether we're talking hydrogen water, I'm a huge fan of you know medicinal mushrooms, ratio infused coffee and tea, but get the most out of your fluids. Think right. I mean, you're, you're the master of that, that mindset. But keep in mind, the brain is the most nutrient-dependent, energy-dependent, stress-vulnerable, toxin-vulnerable system. So we need to dot every I and cross every T in, in order to think right. But a person thinks right when they're coming from a space of love and contribution. Move right. Life is motion. Einstein said nothing happens until something moves. My current philosophy on that is every joint, every range of motion, every day, pain-free with the mindset of improving all that in every single joint. Sleep right. It's critical, you know, and, and there's, there's people that are now getting back on that bandwagon, but there's a book called Why We Sleep, and it's over 500 pages of the greatest scientific references out there. Every single species sleeps. It's critical for our brain and body. And the book Peak by Anders Ericsson, the best of the best sleep, 8.6 hours a night. Poop right. That always gets some chuckles. And Eric, I'll tell a story. I was giving a lecture to rocket scientists at NASA, and a rocket scientist asked me, how do you poop right? Yeah, I was in a funny mood that way, right? If you want the money, you got to be funny. I said, well, you don't want a demonstration, do you? You know, that, that got chuckles from the room. But very, very simply, you need enough fiber, water, and neurologic tone to move your bowels every day, and preferably two or three times a day. And then talk right is not just a conversation you have with those around you, but every cell in your body is potentially in communication with every other cell at every other moment. And by the way, the very first step of cancer is a loss of cell-to-cell -cell communication. I could expand on that just briefly because I, I tell a little story, you know, where I'll be at a seminar and there'll be hundreds of doctors in the room and I'll say, look, you know, I'm looking out here and you're all good people, but I don't see anybody sitting on anybody else's lap. Why? Because we honor everybody's space. Now, secondly, when food comes around, we're not stealing off of other people's plates. And then certainly when we need to use the restroom, we go excuse ourselves, we go away from the group and we do that. Cancer cells violate all those laws. They'll crowd your space, they'll eat your food, they'll poop and pee all over you. Uh, and if we're not careful, if we don't create the environment that consistently battles cancer, it's said that we'll all give into it eventually. So all the Magnificent Seven are important for everything, but especially that horrible chronic circumstance, which by the way, barely existed 200 years ago. Really? 1860 US Statistical Abstract, All Cause of Morbidity and Mortality, I'm going to have you guess, how many people in 1860 in the U.S. died of cancer as a percentage of the population? Didn't they call it wasting disease or didn't they have other names for it? They just well, they, they didn't probably, quite... They probably have, but by 1860, it was defined. Okay. I, uh, no idea. 0.6%. Come on. It was 61 out of 10,000 people that died. What was the life expectancy back then? Do you know? If you got to be five, Eric, your life expectancy was 80. And that's well documented what? Uh, in many references. Journal Royal Society of Medicine, an amazing researcher, Paul so Everybody Clayton, died under five, and that's what lowered the average? There was a lot average. of people that died in childbirth. Babies died. I picture, you know, doctors were doing autopsies without washing their hands and going delivering babies and wondering why mothers and babies were dying. Hmm. You know, a guy named Ignaz Semmelweis, you know, brought that into light. And by the way, he said, you should wash your hands after an autopsy. He was so attacked, he ended up losing his mind and died in an insane asylum at age 47 Mom. of suggesting something so preposterous as washing your hands before delivering a baby. So hold on. So I've always heard that life expectancy back in the 1800s was like 37 or something that, that very might low. Be the mathematical average, but if and you then, got to be five, you were going to be 80. Okay. 
because I thought that we went from 37 to whatever we are today, 77, 76, 75, whatever it is, uh, that number because of advancements and everything else. They want us to believe that, Eric. But are, are we still, hold on. So is, is that not true? The 77 thing? We are losing far few babies, thank God. Now in the US, I mean, we're something like 34th in the world in infant mortality of developed nations. So we're doing terrible here. But fewer babies are dying, fewer moms are dying. And you get through those childhood years, you're gonna be fine. But what were the advances? Yeah. I, I could answer that for you. Well, hold on, hold on. Yeah. So I, I'm super curious about this, yeah. you know, cause you've got a lot of knowledge and I, I have nothing but curiosity. Uh, if you, if you live to be five today, yeah. do you know what the age oh, I don't expectancy think we, is? We projected that yet. I mean, you know, let's face it. We've got people that are saying you get another 10 years, you'll get 120, 150. Yeah. You know, David St. Clair, one of the world's greatest aging experts. I, I, I don't know that I agree with that. You know, now you and I have a, a similar background, right. simple background, you know, involved in church, very spiritual, loving family. All that is, is great. And it served us very, very well. But God put us on here for a certain amount of time. And, you know, when man plays God, we get into trouble. I don't think we're going to get that far. Really? We might get 90. Well, what about, what about all the, the biblical stuff where people lived for 100 900, years? 900, 980, Methuselah. Uh, I'm sure. You know, Do you think that was mythical or do you think that was actual? Eric, I'd love to say that I think every word in the Bible is, you know, God's honest truth. But I think some of it is a story to teach. Yeah. Uh, and you know, a metaphor. The, the first, yeah, the first story is the fall of man or a parable. Sure. Yeah. You know, and, and you, you start looking at it and you come to realize maybe people did live longer, but you know, you start looking at someone like Michelangelo. I think he got to be 87, you know, in the, in the 1600s. Now I learned something the other day. I heard something. I shouldn't say I learned it cause I haven't verified it, but apparently he was on the edge of being a grave robber. He wanted to understand anatomy so much that he wanted to do human dissection and it wasn't available. Wow. So he, he did some things that would have definitely been frowned upon to advance his wisdom and to advance art. It's Michelangelo. Michelangelo. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So, well, I don't have the answer. If And, and you're telling me this is like statistically proven. If you live to be five. Yeah. 80. You were looking at 80 yeah, in 1860. I can, yeah, I could give you the reference. Royal Society of Medicine was published, yeah. And that's fascinating. And... Point less than 1%. 0 0.6, 0 0.61. Died of cancer that they know of. And fair enough that they know of. Yep. Because there, there might have been a definition issue or diagnosis issue or you sure. know, we, we, they weren't able to tell. Yeah. Because they didn't have the advancements. I have to believe that there's some of that. But in, in, in the, in the when, when do you think, when did the cancer phenomenon become everywhere? When did that happen? Do you know? Well, this century, for sure, or last century. In the last you know, hundred you, years. You start looking, there, there was a researcher from Tufts University, her name was Anna Soto, uh, and she was doing breast cancer research. And it was a very fascinating story, but they had breast cancer cells from a woman that had died decades earlier. And they took these cells, and for whatever reason, on that particular day, they didn't have any laboratory glassware. The regular dishes weren't there. So they put the cancer in a plastic dish, then went to lunch. And they came back. I've got a fun video of Anna. I'll send it to you if you want. Uh, maybe you can splice it in the podcast. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, she went to lunch and she came back and suddenly these cancer cells had multiplied. And she thought, how is this possible? There's no growth medium. What is feeding the cancer? And then it, it lended itself to look and see what was in that plastic. And it turned out to be something called bisphenol A, which most countries have banned. We haven't yet. It, it's a universal toxin. It's a very powerful estrogen. If they biopsied our fat tissue, we probably have a, more of it than we want. Uh, and that's a big part. They, they call them xenoestrogens. And, and I, we could expand that topic. Xeno means foreign estrogens. There's mm -hmm. also metalloestrogens. Then there's estrogens we make. But one of my mentors in the 90s said, we are swimming in a sea of estrogens fully expecting that men's male sperm count would drop, that prostate cancer would rise, that endometriosis, infertility, breast cancer, all would happen. And he was exactly right. Those things are exploding. But what Anna Soto said in 1940, a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer was something like one in, in 22. Today, one in eight and probably climbing. Have our genes changed that much? I might ask you, how much do you think our genes have changed? I have in, no idea. Almost nothing. Hmm. Almost nothing. But how much has our environment changed? Right. That, it's a very different world. 
Huh. So in your opinion, it's processed foods, like convenience, all the convenience stuff. Is that, is that what's got us between plastics and packaging and processed foods and everything? You know, we used to like, people would go leave the home mm -hmm. all day to be able to bring home the food yeah. for the next day or for that day. And now we get it in a box and it sits on the shelf or whatever. It's a major component for sure. You know, so having taught nutrition for three plus decades, there's a simple quote. There's no agreement on what the best diet is, but there's universal agreement on what the worst diet is. And that's what we're eating here. You know, all this processed garbage. But I, I want to go back because, you know, you're such but a it's reader. it's so tasty sometimes. It can be, right? And, and it's engineered. So th there's a researcher from Kelly, uh, Kelly Brownell, Yale University, he said, food in this country is engineered to be addictive. Mm. It hijacks our pleasure centers, our taste buds. Uh, and by the way, nature's foods can taste that good. You know, you, you've had some great chefs and you, I've shared great meals with you. Mm -hmm. The real stuff can taste phenomenal, but it's expensive and it's full of effort. So what, how can we make it cheap and abundant? You put all kinds of preservatives, chemicals in there. There are people out there called flavor chemists they could make a piece of cardboard taste like filet mignon to you. And I kid you not. And your taste buds won't know the difference, but your body will show the difference. Amazing. So interesting. We live in an in a interesting time where convenience is at all of our fingertips, instant gratification everywhere, low cost. You can, you can. Well, it's subsidized, Eric. Well, what do you mean by subsidized? The government subsidizes these horrible foods, whether you're talking about corn, whether why, you're talking why would they about do that? soy. Well, I think they had good intentions originally. They didn't want people to go hungry. Mm. But when you, when you look at, there's a huge percentage of our calories that are coming from vegetable oils. And that never happened before 100 years ago. And these are pro-inflammatory oils. They're not good for us. Uh, and they're loaded with calories. Now, they last a long, long time, especially if they make them what's known as hydrogenated, right? They make them so they never spoil. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, you throw something, you know, there's a, a video about a McDonald's hamburger. And this guy started a hamburger museum. So it was winter. He bought two burgers, uh, put one in his coat pocket, ate the other, uh, and then forgot about the one in his pocket until the following winter. He pulled it out. It looked the same. It smelled the same. He didn't say he took a bite of it, but it looked exactly the same. So he thought, isn't this interesting? And he started his own hamburger museum with 20 plus year old McDonald's hamburgers that look exactly the same as the day he bought them. Come on. Well, I kid you not. It's pretty fascinating, isn't it? It is. I mean, I, I guess I mean, you were, we're all fighting against gravity. We're fighting against cost and convenience. We're fighting against all the stuff. Um, the, you know, you watch the commercials now people, you know, I spent $3 and I'm full, you know, mm -hmm. $3 at Taco Bell or something. Yeah. You know, you get some Taco Bell meal. How much would you pay for? I, I watched yesterday, uh, this pizza hut meal, which was a pizza and some like, knots garlic knots or something and then a third and then a fourth thing and it was all carbs basically yeah. a, 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 carbs fats a tiny little bit of protein right and they're like how much would you guess for this and how much would you guess for that and that would feed a whole family and it was like 20 but 1995 or something uh delivered to your house so i mean how do you fight the battle with that as far as as there seems to be uh an uprising of people who are saying, I'm sick of that. Well, they're, they're sick of that and sick from that. Sick from that and sick yeah. of that. Yeah. Of, of people saying, you know what? I'm going to eat whole foods. I'm going to, I'm walking away from this stuff. And they're, and it, and they're, it's expressing itself in all kinds of things. The yeah. gluten-free people, the vegan people, the vegetarian people, the, you know, there's even carnivore people. Carnivore yeah. only people. Yeah. That they're, they're just saying, no, I'm I'm doing something because my body either feels different doing it or it's some uh integrity is the wrong word, but it's some sort of they feel wrong eating another living thing. Yeah. Or well, those well certainly there, there there could be ethics, right? Ethical. And, thank and, you, and, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, ethical reasons for it. But Lots of different reasons people are like starting to wrap their identity in, whether it's organic, whole food, you know, these, these 
particular philosophies? You know, if we wanted to sum up nutrition, and now, now we're talking many decades of, of reading it, applying it, teaching it, you know, patients critically ill and, and some of the best athletes in the history of the planet I've, I've been blessed to work with. But I tell people you want to eat real food, clean food, not too much, not too often, every color, every day in a way that honors your physiology, your genetics, and your body goals, mostly plants. There's a lot to mostly unpack. Mostly plants, Mostly really? plants, yeah. Bro, I don't know if I can do the mostly plants. You may not need to, bud. So here's the fascinating thing about it. And, and you know, it's, it's a debate because plants contain something called anti-nutrients. Now, let, let's take that to a whole new level. I, I went to the sphere yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, beautiful, magnificent, epic. And there was drafts eating leaves from a tree. The drafts could pick every leaf, you know, and, and they could just take everything, right? And the tree would die. But the trees, interestingly enough, when the plants, when the drafts start eating them, they release a poison that makes the leaf very undesirable. And not just that tree, they send a message through the root system to the other trees. And just like that, the, you know, it's, it's the check in the ecosystem. So when you, when you start looking at the original paleo pyramid, you know, and, and I've studied it way back when, and one of my students said, you know, Bob, plants don't run very fast. I think that that would actually be the base of the pyramid. Now, when you talk about fast food, what's convenient? Pick an apple off a tree, you know, now assuming that you have the weather that, that you can mm -hmm. do that, but mm -hmm. there, there's plenty of good natural fast foods. But if I were to break that down, eat real food, not the processed junk, not that man-made, not that has any chemicals. One of my great mentors says this, count chemicals, not calories, because the chemicals are making us fat. They're making us sick. They're giving us cancer. And that's pretty much indisputable about that. So real food, and then clean food, same mindset. Hasn't been intoxicated with herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and or genetically modified. Not, you have a follow-up on that? Yeah, I do. Oh, go for it. So the GMOs. Yeah. There's other countries around the world that are, are banning. banning them one yeah. by one. Yeah. We seem to be, I, is it, I wonder if it's our capitalist nature that chases the dollar so hard here in the United States that we're willing to let pharmaceutical companies advertise prescription drugs to our people. We're one of two countries in the world that allows that here in New Zealand. Um, and we also seem to allow these GMOs to kind of run rampant um, for what, not paying attention to whatever the unintended consequence of that might be, might lower the cost, might make it a little bit more productive in the short term, but what's the long term and who owns it? Somebody owning food now uh, is kind of interesting. So I'm just wondering where this lands and how, how it goes, you know, what, what's outlawed, what's not organic, not GMO, not, uh, I'm sure you have strong opinions. Oh, well, there's pros and cons. I not only have strong opinions, I have strong facts. Okay. You know, so part of how it started was really to create, Roundup ready products where they could use these horrible insecticides and not kill the plant. Uh, and, you know, they would do different things like actually harvest it early and then gas it in different ways to ripen it, you know, di different ways of doing that. But glyphosate now in the medical literature is labeled as an autism accelerator and we are all exposed to it. Uh, then you, you mentioned gluten. Well, there's something called celiac disease, which is an autoimmune attack on the intestines triggered by gluten. It's gone up by over 400% in the last 50 years. And when they go back and they, they look at pre-genetically modified gluten to now, that's the trigger. You know, they changed it. We're being exposed to proteins that we've never been exposed to. And there's a lot of people having very serious food reactions. You know, there's a TED Talk. The woman's name is Robin O'Brien. She was mm -hmm. a consultant for the food industry and her child had a anaphylactic reaction at breakfast. You know, thank God she had the, the wisdom to get him to the hospital and, and somehow saved his life. But the doctor said, what'd you feed this child? She says, let go of my ego, let go of my ego blue waffles, a tube of yogurt and orange juice. And, and the doctor said, what are you crazy? Those are some of the most common food allergens around. Are you poisoning your kid? And she said, how can someone be allergic to food? And she started looking at it. That was probably a very rare occurrence. You know, 2000 years ago, they said one man's food's another man's poison. So those reactions probably happened, but not to the degree where they are. Mm. Uh, Jordan Peterson, right? Most people are, are familiar with Jordan Peterson. His daughter, Michaela Peterson, severe rheumatoid arthritis as a child, two, three, four, five years old, multiple joint replacements by her teens. 
she finally went to a doctor and said, why don't you try an elimination diet? And she said, well, I've tried every elimination diet under the sun. He says, why not just try red meat, salt, and water? She said, what will that do? He says, try it. She felt so much better so fast. You know, I think it was within 30 days off of medication, pain-free, no signs of a rheumatoid. And she started trying to bring back food one by one. She couldn't handle any of it. So to this day, who knows, maybe 10 years later, she's still just eating red meat, salt, and water. And so does he. So does he. He switched to Yeah, and he had a huge, huge response to it. Now, I don't think that's the ultimate Yeah, I was just going to ask you because you're you're like all, you know, mostly plants and now. Well, let's look at how God made us. You know, you look, I've got incisors. I got things for ripping. I've got things for grinding. I've got a hybrid GI tract. We're supposed, we're designed to eat all foods. And why mostly plants? There's so much good in plants, so many nutrients. But could there be a problem with plants? Genetic modification, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides and the harsh depletion global of our soil. Just a a little backstory. So it was a little over 100 years ago, scientists figured out that they could grow big plants with only three elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But it takes 30 elements to make healthy plants, animals, and humans. You don't have to be great in math to know that if you pull 30 out for every three you put back in, eventually you're gonna have a problem. And even CIA.gov published this a few decades ago, global mineral depletion is creating a global health problem. So that's the start. If you don't have it, you can't give it. The soil can't give it to the plants. Then the plants can't give it to the animals. The plants and animals can't give it to the humans. Uh, And there's a global nutrition report that says for decades now, malnutrition is the number one cause of death on the planet. Many decades ago, people were starving to death from lack of food being available. But now there's just nothing in the food. Empty calories. So so this is affecting health span. Oh, for sure. So... Um, more dementia, more, more Alzheimer's, cancer, more obesity, glow obesity, diabetes, attention is deficit, bipolar autism. affected. The brain is the most nutrient dependent organ in our entire body. And, and, um, is it shifting? Do you think the mental health just generally? Cause it seems like mental health. And I, I don't know, you tell me. How much of mental health do you think has been impacted by social media and the dopamine addiction and zero attention span and all that versus mental health being affected by diet? What do you think? It might be equal. Really? Yeah. You know, when you look at those dopamine hits, you know, when Kelly Brownell said food is engineered to be addictive, your phone is engineered to be addictive, your your TV, if you watch one, right? Mm -hmm. They want our attention. Hmm. attention grabs dollars. Grant Cardone, right? Taught us Mm -hmm. that very, Mm -hmm. very well. So they want your attention. So they're always giving you clickbait and different things. And they know if you click on something, well, I'm going to send you that again. I'm Mm going to send you that again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Heck I'll I'll mention something. I'm thinking about buying this. And next thing you know, I have an ad for it, you know? So I I mean, I'm cautious. Like if I'm scrolling through something, if if I'm not paying attention and I get distracted and I stay on Mm -hmm. something like for an extra five seconds, not even meaning to, then that's all I'm going to see in my feed for a while. They want your attention. Like, oh my gosh. And they're very good at capturing it. Yeah. So uh, certainly there's so many downsides to that. You know, if you're always chasing pleasure, it takes more. There's something called tolerance and there's something called withdrawal. So anything of addiction, once you start becoming addicted to it, it takes more of it to get the same effect from you. Hmm. Whether we're talking a substance, whether we're talking a click, so maybe you can click once every 10 minutes initially and get that hit you're looking for. Then it's once every five. Then it's once every three. Then you leave the room and you don't have your phone and you're, you're angry. Yeah. You know, so we're being hijacked in, in that way. Did you ever see the uh, Huberman, uh, David Goggins interview about the anterior mid-singulate cortex? I probably saw thing? some of that. Yeah. That this whole idea that there's this place in your head that, is is kind of tr- the size of it is tracked by quality of life and mm-hmm. if it's smaller it's it's worse for you and if it's bigger it's better for you and the only thing that makes it grow is you doing things you don't want to do tough things yeah and if you start liking it then it'll shrink again so constantly challenging yourself to find difficult things which is antithetical to everything that, that drives our culture today is this this pursuit of comfort, this pursuit of immediate gratification, this pursuit of of uh, dopamine? 
versus I'm going to go do something hard just because it's hard. Well, it's an interesting paradox, hmm. you know? So one, we are wired for comfort. You know, we don't want to be cold. We, we, we don't want to be hot. We, we don't want to be in pain, but all growth occurs outside of our comfort zone. So guess what? We can use cold to grow. We can use hot to grow. We can use pain to grow, but you want to use it in a way that you grow from it. You know, Goggins, what a story. You know? It's a story, but I, I'm still, I struggle to understand it uh, because, and, and I'll tell That's you That's why, why there's only one of him. Well, I mean, it, it's been popularized, right? So I, I, I saw a video that his wife posted, you know, maybe a month ago. And she's in her car on the highway and David is running. It's mm -hmm. at night. And he lives here in Las Vegas. And... She said, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what it's like to live with David and what drives him and what makes him who he is. On the way home from the gym, so on the way home from working out, he said, I'm going to go for a hundred mile run tonight. And nobody was, for no purpose, other than to do it. He's already in shape, already doing the stuff. And he's got all kinds of physical challenges because, uh, you know, the toll he's put on his body. Yeah. And he's out there running. And she says, we've been out here for 13 hours. It's cold. He's wearing my socks on his hands. Um, out in the middle of the desert, 37 degrees. And, you know, he's he's going. He's 13 hours in, it's like 60, 60 miles or something. 63 miles. And they had 37 miles to go. I understand doing things you don't want to do disciplining yourself to, to the point of, of being outside of your comfort zone. But what I don't understand is doing it when there's no purpose, like there's no purpose and it might even hurt you if it's doing it because it's going to help me get closer to my, my contribution in the world, or it, it's going to teach me a lesson that I could share with somebody else. It's going to do something, but just, just the pain for the pain. Uh, without a purpose, I struggle. Do you have an answer to that? I don't believe it's without a purpose. I, one, I think he's addicted. But two, I, I think his his identity is, I'm the toughest guy that's ever lived, and I'm going to keep raising the bar. And I'm going to show people what's possible. You so know, you think he's doing it so he can tell the story? Or do you think he's doing it because that's He's what not he does? doing it for no reason. I, I can't mm. get inside of David's head. But you don't do anything for no reason. But let's trace it back. He had such a rough existence, yeah. so much pain, so much disappointment, and probably no accolades. I could go back to Mike Tyson. And, you know, Mike Tyson was a street thug that the only thing he ever got accolades for was beating people up. Mm -hmm. So he became quite good at it. Mm -hmm. Goggins, when he lost 100 pounds to join the SEALs, and by the way, didn't pass the test three times. He said, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do it with other, you know, whether it was the Air Airborne Nate Rangers and, and other groups that he did it with. No one's done what he's done. You know, Eric, you're similar. No mm. one's done what you've done, what you're doing with network marketing, how you're building the world. The Excellence Projects is your version of Goggins. How can I raise the bar? Now, this is not painful right. uh, unless you had, you know, something really fun you want to do with Marina, which I trust you do right. plenty of that too, right? right? But hey, you're raising the bar. We just all, we're, we're called to do that. Whatever our niche is, we're called to excellence, to raise the bar, to do as much as we possibly can to, to leave a mark. Yeah. I, again, I, I listened to that whole podcast uh, on the, on the Huberman lab. Is it Huberman mm -hmm. or Huberman? I call him Huberman. Andrew Huberman. Huberman. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Huberman. I've never met him, but uh, I listened to the whole thing and really trying to like, like I'm trying to get it like pain for pain. Just do it. For, if nobody's watching for no reason, this is the, this is the driver. This is the thing. And I'm, I'm still, I'm still searching. I'm you know? chuckling because if anybody gets it, you get it. I you got the beautiful I, I, house. You got the beautiful wife. You got the beautiful life. You yep. got the beautiful jet and you are still grinding. No, I understand. Yeah. But, but it's a, it's purpose driven. So is his. Oh, I, I mean, when you listen to it, I, I, maybe it is. It just doesn't feel like there it. There was some funny YouTube video where Elon Musk finally gets his group to Mars. And as they're getting up there, there's David Goggins running on Mars. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's the mark he's left on the world. I guess. Yeah. I guess just letting people know it's possible. That's it's the possible. thing. 
Just pushing the human body? Hey, if you don't think it's possible, you don't do it, right? Big Al, right? He says, yeah. look, if I give you a billion dollars to go pick up your house, are you even going to try? No, because it's not possible. Hmm. Goggins has broken down so many barriers. I guess. But I it's guess. just his category. Yeah, you know? and, and again, you know, he lives in this town. I don't I, I don't know him. I got to get to know him. You got to uh, have him on the podcast. I know, I know. We, we, we got to, we got to, we have to hang out because, yeah. well, and I'm a little worried, you know, because if I hang out, he's going to make me do something. Of course, uh, he that is. that is is going to be painful and and very very difficult. And I'm I'm trying to ride the line between fitness and injury. Currently, tough like, line. Like, I understand yes. that line. I'm like, uh, yeah. and I've learned to listen. Like, oh, pay attention. Good for you. Easier to go. Don't listen. Yeah. Ignore. Ignore that voice that's in your body that says this hurts. Just keep going. Hey, um, if you're 20, that's different. <laughs> right? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe when you're 60, it's a little. It's a, little a different, bit different ball game. Hey there, just a quick interruption, especially for network marketers. Whether you're just starting out or if you're ready to level up, GoPro Academy has just what you need to take your network marketing business to the next level. Get step-by-step -step training on how to get started or restarted the right way, and then get everything you need to earn six figures or more and become a network marketing pro. To learn more, just visit goproacademy.com. I've helped millions of people learn how to recruit tens of thousands of people to reach six figures. And I've personally helped more than a thousand people achieve seven figure incomes and above in network marketing. I can help you too. head to goproacademy.com today. And I'll see you there. Uh, all right. So this is all great. We're, we're, I want to get into your story and the network, network marketing journey and all that, but um, I'm so interested in, health, nutrition, uh, longevity, you know, well-being generally, uh, because that's been a contradiction in, in my life for forever. You know, it's, it's like I have the business thing figured out, entrepreneur thing figured out, the network marketing thing figured out, but not really the health thing. I'm, I'm working on that, those pieces, right? Well, Eric, could I coach you for a second here? Please, please, please. Change your self-talk. Change your identity. Mm, mm, mm. Here's the Eric Warrior I know. Fair, fair. Absolutely capable of whatever Eric decides to do. Yeah. And that's the Eric the world knows. Yeah. Fair. You know? Yeah. And and when you look at the well, you've made a ton of progress mm -hmm. and you'll continue. Just, you know, as Tony Robbins said, this greatest driving force in the world is your identity. Hey, okay, I've been there, I've done that, I figured out what bad choices do to me. I don't like that anymore. From here forward. I realize that everything I say and do has an impact on the entire world. So why not make it the best? Why not show up my best? You know, just before the last virtual goal pro, you were saying, Hey, I want to lose 15 pounds. What about just, you know, sitting in a sauna for three days and not doing anything. I said, Eric, you'd lose the 15 pounds. You're not going to show up as your best. Right. You know, and the world deserves you at your best always. And right. you're always raising the bar. Right. Well, thanks on the self-talk thing. That, that's right. That's accurate. Um, and, and, Maybe the self-talk comes from, this has been a blind spot in my life for forever, right? I have leaks in here, in, in this whole area between uh, all the health stuff, between drinking enough water, to sleep, to nutrition, to exercise. I have leaks that self-talk comes from maybe starting and stopping 800 times over the course of a lifetime and going, ah, oh, what the heck, man? Uh, so like one of my leaks is restaurants. It's an, it's like maybe the biggest, if I'm in my bubble here mm -hmm. and I've got you know it all mapped out, I'm good. No problem. I don't have to have to worry about cravings. Nothing. I go to a restaurant, my brain leaves my body. It's just, it just does. Okay, that's the old Eric. The new Eric takes Man. his brain with him. He says, no bread on the table, first and foremost. <laughs> I don't need to see the menu. I want your grilled fish and a nice salad with vinegar and oil. I, it should. And it will. Well, last night it didn't. All right, today's I went day. to Joe Robichon last night and it was unbelievable. Fantastic, spectacular food. If you're ever in MGM, you gotta go there. But- and it was amazing and it wasn't too much, but it was outside of the program, you know? So it, it's a leak. I, I just, I, I try to figure out a way in these environments that are leak environments that my brain doesn't leave my body. 
environment trumps wind pop willpower every time. Yeah. Maybe I just need to not go to restaurants. If you're living in a, in a freezer, you're not going to stay warm. I don't care how many layers you put on, right? So environment trumps willpower. Take that one to the bank. Mm. Um, you know, but you, you've made great progress. You're better than you were yesterday. You're yeah. Better than you were a year ago. I what get it. What a beautiful it. path. I get it. I get it. All right. So I'm just trying to figure all this stuff out. Um, you've been coaching people on, is, has nutrition been your thing mostly? Well, or, it's a big part of it. Or just a piece of it? Yeah. No, well, no I certainly... I'll, I'll share with you, Eric, a, a, a paradigm shifting moment for me. Hmm. I was, I was at a conference one time and, and any, anytime any patient would come to me, but the question I would ask is what is the one thing that I could do for this individual that would make the biggest difference? And then one of my mentors said to me, he says, you know, Bob, isn't that like asking what's the least I can do to get the most? Why don't you ask what's the most you can do to get the most? And I thought, whoa, that makes sense. Hmm. Why not start out right away? The only way to have health is to earn health. Why don't you start eating right, drinking right, thinking right, moving right, sleeping right, pooping right, when talking right. We're, we're talking 1990s, you know, okay. Southern California conference. Maybe it was 1993. I was already successful. Uh, and then suddenly it's like, okay, that's a much better question. Instead of asking the least, why not ask for the most and, and start helping people in as many ways as possible. You know, and then my practice grew exponentially. By my fifth year, I'd seen world champions from most sports. You know, I think my sixth year is the first time I saw Evander Holyfield, and I saw Yao Ming, and I saw some amazing people, all sent by referral and all paying to see me. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it's like build it and they will come. Here's what they knew. I was going to do whatever it took, dot every I, cross every T, to help them achieve their goal as fast as possible. And when we started doing that, well, the world opens up. Was it different for different people or was, was there commonality? There's always commonalities, but there's always differences. Okay. Now, if you're not customizing the program, then, then you're missing that you have a unique individual with you. There are certain principles that will always apply, but how we apply them to each individual, that's what's amazing, right? So what, what would cause you to understand that there's something that you need to customize? Versus a, 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 well, a good, a good standard assessment. Protocol. Well, let, let's just go with this. If you're not assessing, you're guessing. That's one of the best blood, quotes I've ever heard. Blood or what? Blood, saliva, urine, lifestyle, history, physical exam. All these things count. Okay. And you want to dot every I and cross every T. And, you know, I tell a story. Here's where you are. Here's how you likely got here. If you're happy there, here's where this goes. And then you paint a picture. Okay, that's not where I want to go. All right. Now, do you want to get better, slow, or fast? Most people say fast. I want to be better yesterday. Bodies respond to frequency, duration, intensity, quality, and timing of stimuli. Hold so, on, hold on. You got to say that a little slower. Okay. Bodies respond to frequency, duration, intensity, quality, and timing of stimuli. So what does that all mean? It means frequency of what? Frequency of whatever you're doing to get better. Okay. How often are you working out? Right. When, when, when I'm trying to change something biochemically, I'll have people take nutrients every waking hour. Hmm. Uh, and I... I in, in my heart, I think it's life-saving. Certainly people that were given death sentence are alive today. Is that all that did it? I don't know. Hmm. You know, but you start changing people and you start changing their chemistry and a little bit of light starts to shine and they suddenly go, wait a minute, there is hope for me. Hmm. Uh, and that may be one of the greatest powers on the planet. Hmm. Interesting. In, in terms of like, I'm bouncing around and I'm, I'm just using you as as my own uh, consultant for the moment. Um, in terms of increasing your metabolism, mm -hmm. what are the best ways to get your metabolism going faster? I'm super annoyed. I'll give you an example. Our chef, Joe, who you, who, who you met, my strain on my whoop band, I have to really work. To, to get it to the optimal, like it's like three hours of intensity to get there. Wow. He gets there with 45 minutes and, and doing chef work. Um, and, and his just pegged and you know, he's 29 or something like that. Uh, is it age that all of a sudden is like giving him his, his clock is, and he's burning like 3,500 calories in a day. I'm burning like 22, 2,300 in a day. What the heck? 
Well, let's first talk, what is metabolism? It's the production of energy. It's converting some type of raw material into fuel that we burn for energy and actually give off as carbon dioxide and water. So let's not make it complicated. How efficiently do you do that? So many factors are involved. You know, the thyroid is going to control the metabolic rate of 99% of the tissue in your body. It's also the most environmentally sensitive organ. If you're stressed, if you're toxic, if you're malnourished, all these things have the ability to shut down your thyroid. I mentioned the term estrogens. You know, women have 600% more hypothyroid than men. As we build estrogens in our system, they increase a protein in the blood. And I don't want to get too technical for your audience, but it's called thyroid hormone binding globulin. And if I bind up your thyroid hormone, it doesn't work in the tissue like it's supposed to. So you know, it's pretty much accepted that we all have toxic, and I do mean all of us, we all have toxic levels of estrogens in our body, whether it's plastics, pesticides, metals, and it's creating a subclinical or even clinical hypothyroid, which by the way, that can also lead to autoimmunity, which, which is a bad deal. But you've got to manage your weaknesses to move forward. I would suggest because you're so bulletproof, you probably run real high levels of stress. Stress shuts down metabolism by more mechanisms but, than we can count. Now, cortisol. So, yeah, cortisol. So I had this, and I don't know if I'm stressed, but I've just dealt with it for so long that I'm, I'm fine. Or, or I appear to be fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Gary gave me something when we were talking. He said, uh, aging is the, pro uh, the aggressive pursuit of comfort. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute, because my doctor said, you got to really avoid stress. So if I'm stressed, I should go lay down. I should go relax. I should go just chill. And, and Gary's like, no, 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 no. If you're stressed, you need to stress the body. If you're stressed, you need to go for a walk or Burn a run. Off the stress. Sure. If you're stressed, you need to go physically exert yourself. I'm like, well, hold on. That was completely different. I thought I'm supposed to go the opposite way. He said, no, no, no. You need to go, go in the gym. If you're stressed, get on the treadmill. If you're stressed, get on the rowing machine. If you're stressed, go push some weight around. I'm like, if you're stressed, go in the sauna. And you know, that's a productive use of it. Yeah. Yeah. So is when you're, how, <laughs> how do you, what is your antidote to stress? What is your antidote? Happy. Well, come on. You can't just I, say, I'm going to just be happy. And then, no, and I'm, pursue, I'm happy. Pursue happy. You know, you know, for instance, the process, right? If you're, if you're working out, well, there might be some pain in the set, but you're happy that you accomplish it. You're happy that you're taking a step towards your goal. You know, we could go to Earl Nightingale, right? The progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Mm -hmm. I believe that that is the antidote of stress. So maybe, maybe happy wasn't the best term. But I'm, I'm always in a progressive pursuit. And would you say my cortisol might be high? Yeah. See? So, but, so how? How, how you do you what? balance that? Maybe we need, I think you just really started a very interesting conversation. You need to go at in a balanced, empowering way. You know, when, when, when you have the time to take good care of yourself, you need to take care of you first, right? Put that oxygen mask on first. Mm -hmm. You will need to nourish yourself and exercise in ways that you love prioritize sleep, prioritize that downtime. You know, I, I, I've met, I don't know, tens of thousands, maybe more than that, people in my entire life. You're in the upper echelon of the most driven people I've ever met. And it serves you quite well, mm -hmm. but you're seeing the downside of it too. And by the way, getting back to this visceral adipose tissue, mm -hmm. there's a quote from the medical literature, regional fat distribution is under endocrine control. So women store fat differently than men. Regional fat, where you store your fat depends on your hormones, put it in layman's terms. What hormone do you think creates visceral adipose tissue? Well, you're going to tell me stress. Some it's stress hormone. It's a chronic stress hormone, cortisol. So, and, and that visceral adipose tissue is at least three times more pro-inflammatory than other tissues. They call it angry fat. So you don't want that. So whether you're having it now, and you probably have less than you did. In fact, I know you have less than you did. Mm -hmm, yeah. But you put it there. You earned it. Yeah. But, okay, I'm still not getting, it's still not helping me yet. Okay. I. Like if I'm happy, I'm driven. I am happy. I'm you are very I'm, happy. I'll I'm, give you I'm, that. I'm uh, purpose driven. I am about contribution. Um, I enjoy my family. I am proud of myself for what I'm doing with my health. Those types of things. I'm taking steps towards the nutrition thing. I'm making progress there. 
cortisol, metabolism, those things. They're big. I get it. But at the same time, I feel like I'm stressing the system when I'm stressed. I'm going to do the things. When we're done with this, I'm going to go work out, you know, because I, I early morning today and wasn't able to do my normal early morning routine. So I'm going to go do the whole thing for a couple hours. I'm going to do the red light therapy and I'm going to do the oxygen. I'm going to do the infrared on. I'm going to do the, I'm going to push weight around and do a little bit of cardio. So I feel like I'm doing that stuff. Sleep's an issue. If, if I mean, eight hours is very difficult. Um, and that just happened in the last couple of years. The seven's the norm. Six fifty seven is the norm. I'd love to get to eight, eight and a half. Struggle with that. Um, so how do I lower my cortisol? How does this work? I'm doing all the, the stuff. I'm doing literally all the stuff. I'm on a protocol top to bottom with everything, with my hormones and peptides and the works. So what do I do? We're, we're going to look at good and bad. Okay. Right? Your good is really good. You've got to have less of the bad at this moment in time. There's a simple rule. It's easier to stay out of trouble and get out of trouble. You got yeah. yourself metabolically in trouble. Yeah. It's not going to turn around overnight, even though you've made magnificent changes in it. Mm -hmm. And the more you do right, the faster you're going to get where you want to be. When you do something wrong, you may step yourself further back. Sure. You know, I'll, I'll go with a, a simple example. Some people can drink alcohol. You know, I, I don't have any issues with alcoholism, but if I have more than one and a half drinks, I wake up with a headache. It's mm -hmm. beyond where I need to go. There may be some workload that's beyond what's healthy for you. Mm. You know, they're, they're, you're so good at taking on things and, and leading and charging. Uh, if I were to give you one piece of advice, keep going, expand your team, not so much Eric. I mean, I know Eric is the brand. Eric is the center of the show. And Eric always over delivers. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. But we love you enough to say, stop. Take care of you a little more. I don't mean stop, stop. Back it off just enough. Well, walk me through what that means. I see you do a big event three days on 24-7, 365, dotting every I, crossing every T, having an after party afterwards, right? Wearing yourself out. And as you've said, then I need to stare at the wall for about three days. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to make those events easier on you where, you know, it's not three days staring on the wall. You know, you, you feel good enough to have a couple mild days, but not total shutdown. Right. Um, and I believe that you can, I mean, you deliver such a good product. If you just expand your team a bit, that that's probably what I would suggest to you. All right. I, I, and, and on metabolism, does that, are they, are they tied together? How do I speed it up? Exactly what you're doing the right things, but less of the wrong. If you're going out and having a bad meal, that's going to slow you down. If you're not getting a good night's sleep, that's going to slow you down. Interesting enough, if you overtrain, that's going to slow you down. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got what, to dance. How do you know overtraining? Good question. So we have a lot of sophisticated ways. Like I, I wear an aura ring. It'll tell me my, my readiness. But I work with triathletes, Ironmen. So you know, if I go to the strain that it's suggesting and I don't go beyond that strain for optimal per day, it, it, I, I shouldn't be overtraining. I shouldn't be w wiping out my adrenals. Well, let's or whatever. see what the result is in terms of body comp, energy, sleep, everything that you're looking at. Mm. It, it's all absolutely connected. All right. All right. Yeah, we, we want a an simple answer, don't we? No, I, I, you know? I'm just, I, I'm searching for answers everywhere. And I'm you're just, a seeker I'm, and a finder and an applier. Just yeah. keep doing it. Yeah. Less so than bad, more I'm trying good. to learn. I'm trying to, to like piece it all together. The stuff that works for me, stuff that doesn't work for me, my friends that are having things and everybody's got an opinion on all this stuff. Um, all right, let's pivot. Let's pivot. All this is great. And all this is fantastic. You are a part-time network marketer and you're a part-time professional network marketer. And that's kind of rare. Um, how did you get introduced to this, to the network marketing space, being you know, a, a medical health professional as you are? Uh, how did you get introduced to, to this thing? And how did you say, you know what, there might be an opportunity for me here? Well, let me go back even further. Okay. You know, I grew up hungry. So 18 years old, I'm selling coupon books door to door, top salesman in the company. They called the, the happenings animal. book. No, no, it was, it, it was a, I even have to think of the name of it, but it was a, a partial fundraiser in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you know, a dollar goes to charity and coupons for 
terrible stuff like Coca-Cola, Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? But I had a good pitch and I could talk to people. And Eric, I, I walk up to the door and there's, there's this woman. I knock on her door. I start giving her my pitch. And she's staring me, at me in a weird way. Not, not a, a way that, you know, would make me think I was at risk or something like that. But it, there was just a look in her face and she says, stop. I said, what's up? She says, you would be perfect in my business. And I said, what's your business? She says, you know what? I'm partnered with multiple multimillionaires. They're teaching me how to become independently wealthy in the next five to 10 years. And you know what? If you want to know what they're teaching me, show up tomorrow night, dress sharp, bring a notebook. I'll introduce you to my millionaire friends. So I show up to an Amway lecture hmm. and they're drawing the circles. And you know, my, my first degree is electrical engineering. I'm a math major. I understand compounding. I looked at that. I, I didn't know the model existed. I thought, well, that's real. I'll crush it. So I said, all right, I'm going to do this. So I went home and there was my brother-in-law who was a genius, a chess champion, a you know, big eight firm accountant. And I told him what I just saw. He says, Bob, that's Amway. You don't want to do it. And I said, why not? He says, look, my brother and I still have a garage full of soap. You don't want to do it. And, you know, not digging into it. I was only 18. What did I know? I thought, okay, Dan can't do it. It can't be done. So I walked away from it. Uh, and I had been prospected who knows how many times over the years, and especially when I became a chiropractor. People come into my office, they take up my valuable clinic time trying to pitch me on something. So we wrote an office policy. We will not do network marketing. And then we put a sign on our door, network marketers not welcome, right? That, that's about wow. as against it as you can be. So then 12 years ago, my son was still in high school. He was a senior and I'm at my you know, computer at, at the front table and Jacob walks in. He says, dad, dad, dad. I could tell he's very excited. I said, what's up, son? He says, I just invested in a coffee business. I said, uh, good for you. And, and in my mind, I'm going, how could you do that? You're a lifeguard. Warren Buffett invests in coffee. He says, dad, it's healthy coffee. I said, yeah, better yet. He says, dad, I want you to sell it in the clinic. I just said, no. He says, what do you mean? No. I said, no. He said, why do you say no? I said, Jacob, I work with critically ill people. I work with elite athletes. Coffee's not my business. He goes, but dad, it's healthy. You should sell it. I said, I don't care. He says, look, at least check it out. And, and Eric, I, I, these words are pretty close to what I said from, from that memory. I said, Jacob, I think you've been scanned. I'm going to help you get your money back, which by the way, <laughs> you know, my, my son's been, you know, a, a tremendous success because of that decision. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, he says, dad, check it out. So I check it out, organic, all the quality certifications infused with the top superfood on the planet. I said, all right, Jacob, I don't need anything else to do, but if you can find a way where the staff can promote it and I don't have to do anything, I'm okay with that. So he made a sign on his computer, put samples of water boil in the waiting area, told my staff, when people come in, offer them a cup of coffee or tea, ask them, how do you like it? Strong, mild in between. Make them as they like it. As they're drinking it, ask them, how do you like that? And they'll usually say, it's good. Say, it's good for you too. You should get a box. First month, we sell $1,000 worth. No big deal when you got a big clinic, right? You don't even notice a thousand. But then it was two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand. People started calling before the weekend, saying, "What time do you close? I need to get my coffee before the weekend." And I started to realize, okay, there's something to this. But here was the the breaking point. Jacob uh, did his first semester of business at Colorado State, first and last. And I went out to go skiing with him in Colorado, and he says, "Dad, can we have a serious conversation?" I said, "Sure." He says, "Dad, I don't think this is for me." I said, "What's not for you?" He says, business school. I said, and now I'm concerned. I said, why? He says, well, I, first I learned that none of my professors have ever had a business of their own. I said, fair enough. He says, by the way, I think I'm already making more money than they are. And I said, what makes you say that? He says, look, I'm driving a brand new Mercedes, right? They had a real nice car plan uh, and they're driving rust buckets. And I said, you got a few good points. And, and he knew how to push my buttons, right? My wife taught him really well. The anti-establishment buttons. Yeah. So he says, Dad, I want, to, I want to finish my semester here. I want to move home. I want to build my coffee business. And I'd like your support. I says, all right, son. You've already shown that you're going to put the work in. You've got my support. So he comes back. And it was the second week of January. They had a big convention in Houston. Now, back then, I was lecturing around the world 40 to 50 times a year. So my downtime was very precious. And Jacob comes up to me, he says, dad, you're in town next weekend, right? I said, yeah. He says, I want you to go to our event. Tell me about it. Well, it's two days. I, no. He says, dad, you said you'd support me. I said, I will support you. He said, this is what I need as your support. And I thought, oh my gosh, right? My, my parents taught me to be true to my word. Okay, I'm going. I didn't want to be there. In fact, it was a beautiful January day. I'm in the park working out in between. But someone on stage told a story 
that changed my life. It was a rags to riches, down and out, you know, a guy that had his truck repossessed with his son's wheelchair in back. And he went to the repo lot to get the truck back. And the guy said, sure, you can get the truck, you know, or he said, sorry, he says, I, I want my chair back. And the guy says, well, sure, you get the chair back as soon as you catch up on your payments. So this guy left totally, you know, depleted, feeling like the worst dad ever. And he had been prospected by the same company. So they, you know, he called him up and says, look, I need money fast. What do I do? He says, call everybody in your phone. Tell them you lost your truck. You lost little Johnny's wheelchair. Will you help me out and buy two boxes of coffee? He made 5,000 bucks in two hours. Got the truck back, got the wheelchair back. And, you know, we have a ring called Diamond, you know, where you cross 200,000 a month in team sales. And he was giving his Diamond speech. And I thought, if I'm serious about helping people, this is an avenue that can help more people that I want to help that I wouldn't have any other means. So I said, all right, let's do this. You know, then they announced the contest and, and my wife, you know, she, she's very competitive. She says, we're winning this, you know, uh, and we became the top recruiter in the entire company just like that. And part-time. Yeah. And you've been part-time for how long? All 12 years. 12 years you've been part-time. Yeah. And realistically, how many well, hours? And by we... the way, that was 11 years because the first year I wasn't building. Sure. Yeah. So 11 years. How many hours a week, realistic, do you, do you think that you commit to building your network marketing business? Well, I'm going to say average, yeah. 15, light, 10. I would say almost always at least 10. Um, if I'm going for something, maybe 20, but you taught us well, I have three blitz weeks a year, you know, coming around conventions, events, promotions, where that week I'll probably put in 60, 80 hours on top of everything else I'm doing, just reaching out. And, and it's so amazing because the leverage is, is there. And Eric, one of my mentors taught me this, and, and you'll love this. If you can achieve your goals all alone, they're not very big. Hmm. You know, I thought, okay, if I want big, and, and I'd done some wonderful big things relatively by myself, but there's nothing like having a team. We're now approaching 29,000 people in 20 countries. You look at that leverage, it's powerful. 29,000 people that you've built over the course of these 11 years and all part-time. Um, I'm just wondering if we, uh, from a claim perspective, we could talk about how much you've earned. Uh, a did, lot. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is there a, a number we could talk about over the course of 11 years, a range? Well, let's just say this. So, you know, our, our team is approaching 50 million in, in team sales. And Richard Bliss, I know you love him. You've had yeah, him on sure. stage. Uh, yeah, you introduced me to him, and I've, I've loved him ever since. Great guy, yeah. You know, he says the average network marketing company pays about 7%. Well, our team is so strong, and our compensation plan is good. We're over 8%. So you do the math on that. That's wonderful part-time income. So what, what you do the math 8%, 8 for me. of 50 million would be 4 million. 4 million. O over the course of, you know, 12 years. Yeah, yeah. And you divide that out. Now, keep in mind, the back end is a lot heavier than the front end. Sure. So... Uh, what has caused you not to like say, you know what? Because I mean, having a divided mind has got to be challenging because you got your practice, you got this. Who said I had a divided mind? Well, it's it's a divide. It's a different discipline to, to achieve a, a, Fair sim enough. a similar result. Right. So I'm such a simple creature that I can I can deal with multiple things in a vertical. Mm -hmm. But if. They're separate things. Like I would not be able to function having a job and growing a network marketing team. Just wouldn't be able to do it. My, my brain would explode. Um, the, the, the whole serving two masters kind of thing. Yeah. So. There's one master. Yeah, okay. Well, we it? serve the same master, but there's also health, right? Yeah. Health is, it's everything that I'm going to share. And this is leveraged health. You know, and I, you know, I hired a social media team and, and you want to reach, enhance your reach, revenue and impact. And what healthcare practitioner doesn't want to do that? Mm. You know, can you, how much impact you have on your patients, those you want to help get better when they're not with you mm. and most people very little. And then look at the magic of coffee. And that's really the genius. Yeah. You know, I, I look at all my world champions and when they were in their season pursuing a championship or whatever, a new contract. They were diligent about every aspect of their life. Season ended, got the championship. They stopped the supplements for the most part, changed a lot. Coffee drinkers, they never need to be reminded. They never plan to quit. Ours is turbocharged. Mm -hmm. So we're serving one master, the master of health, the master of a better life, only now with a lot of leverage. Right. So I, I don't see myself divided. Now, what keeps me in practice? I love it. 
You know, uh, I, you know I, I put all that effort in not to make a living, but to make a great life of contribution. Hmm. And, and I'm still passionate about digging into the data. How can I help this person get better? And what's the simplest hack? Hey, if, if you're doing this every day and I make it 10x better, wouldn't that be better for you? So there's so many physicians that seem to be, mm, I would say a lot of my physician, physician friends always are open for a, an investment. Mm -hmm. They're looking to put some money, some money. into yeah. the building that they're in or into something, you know, they're, they're, and some of them are good business people. And some of them are not good business people. Uh, but it's like those guys, the, the physicians and pilots as well, you know, they're, they're always trying to look for something in order to be able to create some additional leverage in some way. What have you learned about this process and what could other physicians learn? Because there are certainly limitations in the healthcare field. Well, more than ever, maybe. Yeah. More Regulations, yeah. insurance, um, risk. Yeah. When it comes to lawsuits and, you know, people taking shots at you for trying to help, uh, all of that type of stuff. What have you learned and, and what could other physicians learn about something like this? Some sort of network marketing side thing that would complement their, their work when it comes to helping people. Well, I learned this in, in a way that it's, it's a truth that you'll know. When I made the decision to do network marketing, I, I pitched a lot of my friends, my, you know, my nutrition companies that sponsor me. And one of the guys looked at me and says, Bob, why are you doing that? You know, I mean, taxi drivers do that type of thing, right? <laughs> I, I mean, they're, they're smart enough to do it. Why not? I, so whether it's, you know, the, the phrase is whether you're from Yale or from jail, right. I actually think people from jail have a better shot because they're hungrier. Sure. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll take a little spin on this and it's going to be an answer to your question, but I, I have a patient that wrote a book from ditches to riches uh, and very fascinating. That was his story. He was a drunk driver and finally got his life turned around when he, when he nearly died and then found the path to, to wealth, which wasn't network marketing in his case. But he says there's two types of smarts. There's street smarts, and he likes to call that SS. And there's book smarts, and he calls that BS. And he says book smarts without street smarts is just BS. Hmm. You know, So you've got those street smarts. Stormy Wellington has those street smarts. She really loved that when I said that. Most doctors aren't very street smart, and they have a lot of their self-esteem in what their title is mm. and I think how the world perceives them and God bless them. They put a lot of work in and hopefully they have a good heart and hopefully they're doing a lot of good work. But if you can just leave the ego out of it, you know, I think Ryan Holiday wrote the book, The Ego is the Enemy. It certainly is. If you think you're above taking on a different business model that is more powerful in every way, like you say, it's not perfect, but it's better. Who doesn't want better? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants better but some people let their ego get in the way of it or the esteem issue. And, you know, there's plenty of people that said no to me way back when, how many of them wish that, you know, would trade places with me. I might suggest every one of them, hmm. especially when the pandemic hit and suddenly, you know, people are wondering, okay, where did my future go? This job I thought was so secure, this career. I mean, surgeons were put out of business for a period of time. How can that be? They shut down everything that wasn't COVID related. Yeah. So, you know, it makes perfect sense. Dig your well before you're thirsty. Your network is your net worth. You know, all those things that you know. If we had a way to interact with everybody in a way that said, look, it's not perfect, like you say. It is better. Here's why. You don't have to do it with me, but I would strongly suggest you find something that resonates with your value system, the impact you want to make on the world, and create the leverage that can change the world. I think that's the right message. You've been with your company for 12 years, 11 building uh, an organization. And anytime you're with a company that long, there's it's not gonna be uh, an automatic straight up ride, you know, up and to the right. You know, sometimes there's gonna be obstacles. There's gonna be issues, there's gonna be challenges. And when there are challenges, there are some people like, well, Challenge is here. I need to go find something else. And there are other people who say, well, the challenge is here. I need to be part of the solution. So 
you chose in the face of you know, a handful of challenges over the course of the last 11 years to just stay where you were planted and be part of the solution. What caused you to make that decision when other people didn't? Well, I think I knew what we had. You know, we're the most solid team in the entire company. And, you know, that 50 million in sales, 94% of it is reorders. That's pretty sticky. Those are, those are good products. And I knew that the founder of our company was a wonderful man with an absolutely great heart. Uh, and there was a number of things that caused them to get into big trouble. So they, they got sold. And, you know, when we're being introduced to the new owners, I mean, people in the room were just crying. Everything's over, everything else. And this is where I suddenly became maybe the face and voice of the company because I just said, wait a minute, I just have one question. I asked our founder, I said, is your life better with this move? He says, absolutely it is. I said, are all the good things that were in place, are they still in place? He says, they are. I said, then you have my 100% commitment to help you through this process. Uh, and then the new owner sat down with me. He says, Bob, we're going to lose a lot of people. We're going to go through a lot of changes. Uh, we are expecting that. He says, but those who stick it out, it'll be the best decision of their entire life. So suddenly there was, you know, not that there's competition. You know, we were really, we had a lot of momentum. You know, we had the number one earner, the number two earner, right? You had them on their stage. It was so amazing. All that momentum just disappeared and all those people went away. Interesting enough, it's either eight or 10 of the top people started their own network marketing companies. Mm. Good for them. Right. But what did that do? It created a total gap and void. And like you said, now it's time to grab market share. And we did. Uh, and it was a great thing for our team because I sat down with all of our leaders and I said, all right, there's a lot of people that are upset. I talked to our founder. He's very happy about this. I talked to our new CEO. I love his vision. Let's do this. Hmm. And, and, and they, you know, we got total buy in and we moved it forward. And by the way, it wasn't much after that that you know, I joined your mastermind, which sure. certainly the best business decision that anybody can make when you can hang out with the best of the best. I'm kind of a small fish in that bowl. It's a little odd, but how wonderful where everybody around you has something to offer. Yeah. I love that. So last piece of advice from you as my friend, the part-time professional, uh, what advice do you have for people that are either looking at this or they're part-time or they want to do something serious and this is in alignment with their values, um, but they, they're not quite living up to their potential? Well, that's uh, all of us, isn't it? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. What advice do you have for them? Well, one, get clarity. Know about, and, and I'm going to give it two pieces. Get clarity and then build a system that'll make that happen. You know, get coached. Get in the environment. Environment trumps willpower. Uh, you can say, I want to do this, but if you're not accountable, if you don't have the groups, if you're not on the calls and someone's calling you out for not showing up, you know, like, like you said it in, in your game plan interview, look, there's going to be times, everybody has bad times. You, you're going to step away. And when you step away, you want me to just let you drift? Or do you want me to bring you back in and remind you why you made that decision in the first place? By the way, I've done this with my patients. So you talk about synergy. I use with my patients every time. If I would you, if mm -hmm. I could create a program that would make that diabetes go away in 60 days, would you be mm. all in on it? You mm. know, mm. it's just brilliant. It's brilliant. So get clarity, create the environment, get coaching, Love you know, it. and listen, I, I have no problem promoting you because you're the most impactful financial person of my entire life. And you have the, the ability to impact so much more. And that's why I have a vested interest in keeping you healthy. Yes. For man. a long time. Yes. Amen. Well, uh, Dr. Bob, I appreciate you coming in, spending some time, sharing some wisdom, sharing some health tips and what we need to do in order to be able to get better. Um, I appreciate you. Well, I love you, Eric. You're amazing. You and Marina, you, you've made the world so much better. You know, when we were driving in, my taxi driver said, who lives here? I said, you've got to impact millions to live here. And the guy I'm going to see has impacted millions. And guess what? He's just getting warmed up. So that's our conversation with Dr. Bob Rukowski. I hope you enjoyed it. Lots of different things. So many things going on with our health environment. We're biohacking. We're biostacking. I hope you're paying attention to it. I know that I am. And also this unique part-time professional making a full-time income in a part-time effort and combining that with your passion. For those part-time people out there wondering if you can do this part-time, 
Dr. Bob is certainly an example that that is possible. So if you got value from this, as always, give us a like, give us a review, but most importantly, share this with somebody that you care about, somebody that is focused on their health or needs to be focused on their health, somebody that maybe is looking for additional sources of revenue, or maybe a healthcare professional that's looking for a way to be able to further help their patients. So send that forward. Help us spread the word. I'd appreciate it. Until next time, everybody, make it an amazing day, and I'll see you soon.